Now, if you look back at the epistle of James, as Pastor James says, look at verse 18, a second point. He didn't just say, beware of mere intellectual faith. Now he says, watch out for emotional faith. Watch out for a faith that is merely an emotional response to the truth. Verse 18, emotional faith is described by James as a form of dead faith that people share with no less than the demons. Demons have strong faith that is intellectual and emotional. They have both. They have a strong intellectual faith in God and a strong emotional response to that faith in God. Follow along as I read verse 18 and 19. But someone will say, you have faith, I have good works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, here's the, the stern second message. You believe that there is one God? And he was playing on the fact this is an early Jewish Hebraic congregation. They knew the Shema and they would just... They, they just did it by rote. The Lord our God is one, the Lord. And they just knew the truth. He says, you believe that there's one God? Even the demons believe that. Look at the end of verse 19. And tremble. Think with me. To illustrate mere emotional faith that's dead, James uses one of the most unbelievable comparisons. He explains to us that one of the inner workings of the spirit world that we wouldn't know about we don't know all this. He, through inspiration, he kind of, he kind of puts a, 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 a lesson to all the illustrations we get in the Gospels. We see a lot of interaction between Jesus and the demons. He tells us, he puts it together with this statement. He applies what the Gospels so clearly illustrated, the complete intellectual and emotional faith of demons that can never save them. James says demons have strong faith. Now, probably that isn't something you thought about. You wouldn't think of demons as having strong faith. And so how does, he, how does he base that? Well, if you surveyed the gospel, there's five things you learn about demons. Let me just read them to you because we're not going through the gospels right now. We're looking at this demon faith in James. But demons in the gospels have clearly defined faith. Number one, demons completely believe in the reality of God. There are no atheist agnostic demons, okay? That's why it's so funny, you know, every time you, you meet a, an atheist or an agnostic, the creatures that are out in the universe that are unhindered by all the frailties of humanity are all believers, okay? There are no atheists out there. There are no agnostics out there. They know all this is true, okay? Think about it. They have no doubts. They've seen the Lord. They've seen his throne. They know all about the spiritual world. They have met Jesus Christ personally. And demons could never be classified as either atheists or agnostics. They have an accurate faith in God intellectually in their minds. What's the lesson? You can believe all the correct facts and still not be saved. That's, that's what demon faith is all about. It's not having an encyclopedic faith that knows all the facts. There's something more. Secondly, demons completely believe in the deity of Christ, which is more than I can say for many religious professionals and clergy around this world. Many of them do not believe in the deity of Christ. All demons believe in the deity of Christ. Amazingly, demons trembled in Christ's presence as he walked the earth. They have no doubts about who he really is. Often we hear the demons publicly stating to Jesus, as in Mark 5, 7, I know who you are. And then they invoke from Isaiah one of the high titles of God, the Holy One of God. Demons completely believe in the deity of Christ. Mark reports Peter's eyewitness account that whenever a demon met Christ on earth, they always fell down and affirmed that he was God the Son. Mark 3, 11 through 12. He said that the demons everywhere fell down and cried out, confessing. Demons had an emotional response to their faith. They feared, they shuddered, and they trembled. But demons are not saved. And James connects people in the church who have a faith that's intellectual and emotional with demons. 
He said you can get that close to Jesus Christ and still not be saved. Thirdly, demons completely believe in the supreme power of Christ over their destiny. They even would plead for some leniency or mercy from Jesus Christ as the ultimate judge who held their eternal destiny in his hands. Just read Mark 5, 1 through 13. The demons begged him. They said, it's not time yet. It's not time for us to go to the fire. Don't send us yet. They knew he held the power. Demons held a firm intellectual faith in the supreme power of Christ over their destiny. Fourthly, demons completely believed in hell and the horror of eternal punishment. They knew and they testified to people that they believed in the existence of a place of punishment. They knew that they were headed toward that torment, as Mark 5, 7 says. And they didn't want to go there before the time, as Matthew 8, 39 says. Demons had a firm emotional faith. Their faith in what God had revealed was so strong, it, it affected their emotions. They were, they were very strong in their requests. Finally, demons completely believe in submission to God's word. I think it's interesting how they responded to the word of God. They never expressed doubt that God's word was true, which is more than we can say about a great part of Christendom today that aren't sure that God has some of the scientific things correct and the historic things and some of the moral things. We're not sure they might be, you know, archaic. Demons expressed no doubt that God's word was true. They usually instantly obeyed the word of God, even though a few did one final shake of their victim or a convulsion just to show their malignant hearts, they always obeyed the word of God. As Jews testified daily in their Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4 that there is only one living and true God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So James repeats, you believe there's only one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Believing to the point of fear and trembling does not save. Only life-changing faith produced by God within can save. So what's the lesson of all this? Well, I believe James, when he preached this to the first church 19 centuries ago, I believe that he was trying to apply that to those people. He was saying, first, intellectual agreement or assent will not save you. Intellectual belief is present in demons, so that's not enough. Secondly, an emotional response coupled with an intellectual response is also not sufficient. Demons had regular emotional responses to their faith in Christ as creator, as omnipotent ruler, as the ultimate judge. None of those intellectual and emotional responses prompted by their faith were sufficient. Now James goes on, starting in verse 20, if you want to look down in your Bibles. And what he says is that sufficient, real, saving faith goes beyond intellectually assenting to the facts and a resulting emotional response to God's word and continues. You do have to have an intellectual belief in the truth. Then you have to have an emotional response. But it doesn't end there. It goes on. And healthy faith is not deficient. It's not defective. It's sound. It's all there. The, all the parts are there and they're functioning. And it goes on and continues, true saving faith, into a life transforming walk. True saving faith shows up over time in a changed life. So what James says, starting in verse 20, is be sure you have vital living faith. At the moment of response, all responses may look genuine, is what he's saying. When, when people respond to the gospel, most responses look quite genuine. And James says this, verse 20, But do you want to know, O foolish man, faith without works is dead. Keep going to verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, this has always been a problem. In the book of Acts chapter 8 and verses 13 through 22, the apostles were even fooled. Don't think that if we had Peter or John or Paul here, we wouldn't have any trouble. They were fooled. Remember Simeon, the sorcerer? He, in Acts chapter 8, fooled even them. They accepted his confession of faith and they baptized him. And then, as time went by, they saw there was no changed heart. And Peter looked at him and he said, You have a heart of darkness. You have never repented. You are not saved. 
See, don't, don't think if we had the apostles walking around that we wouldn't have any false professions. You can't keep from false professions. But you can watch the professors to see if they have a possession, not just a profession. One great preacher wrote these words. James 2 emphasizes that the mature Christian practices the truth. He does not merely hold to ancient doctrines. He practices those doctrines in his everyday life. It's not just a 2,000-year-old, 3,500-year-old at the oldest book. It's something that changes my daily life today. This person continued, His faith is not the dead faith of the intellectuals. It's not the demonic faith of the fallen spirits. It's the dynamic faith, faith that changes a life and goes to work for God.